did lose the last game, but let's not forget that they absolutely did what they wanted to do in games one and two. I mean, you know, people have such short memories that they forget that they completely handled LeBron James and the Cavaliers in the first two games. Did they lose game three? Yes, they did. But let's not forget, you know, those two games and then the previous five games before that handling the Cleveland Cavaliers. They were on a seven-game win streak against those Cavs. Now, I'm thinking, man, you know, Cleveland Cavaliers are kicking themselves and, you know, saying the tail right now because Steph and Clay ha- they haven't played well all series. And, you know, like you said, Golden State handled them the first two games of, of this series. Cleveland could have, you know, if they would have played the way they played in game three, they could have got a split back in Oakland because Steph and Clay hadn't played well. You had Sean Livingston go off for a career high 20 points off the bench in game one. Golden State's bench outscored Cleveland's bench 45 to 10. And then you had Draymond Green go hamburger in game two, you know, and, and Golden State get that 33 point win. And Steph and Clay didn't do anything, you know, for the most part in those two games in Oracle. So Cleveland is definitely back in this series, man, and it's going to be very, very interesting how Game 4 goes at the Quicken Loans Arena. Yeah, tonight, man, is going to be a heck of a game. I see Cleveland trying to come out and match that same intensity, but it's not going to be as easy to do it because the Warriors will be ready. They will have a little blood in their mouth from Game 3, and they're going to come out and play a lot better in my estimation. But again, check that game out tonight. When we come back from this short break, as promised, we'll have Erica Nelson, the Director of Life Skills and Community Outreach at the University of South Carolina, talk about the time that she spent with the late, great Muhammad Ali right here on the All Things Sport Podcast on Spreaker Radio. Hi, this is Damian Banks. Thank you for listening to the All Things Sport Podcast. You can also catch me on the Puff TV Morning Combo on Blog Talk Radio every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9 a.m. Call 347-677-0956 and I'll give you Sports by Damian. The All Things Sport Podcast. We go back like spinal cords and car seats. With Damian Banks and Pierre Banks on Spreaker Radio. Welcome back to the All Things Sport Podcast. I'm Damien. He's Pierre. And we are having such a lively discussion. We've been talking about the NBA playoffs on the All Things Sport Podcast. We are in the finals of the NBA playoffs between the Cleveland Cavaliers and LeBron James and company and Steph Curry, Golden State Warrior. Series is 2-1 to one, heading into game four. Um, Before we went to break, Pierre told you we had a special guest on the show, man. And before we get into the interview with Miss Erica Nelson, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't mention that we had a very, very, very tough week. You know, in the world of sports, we lost, you know, two of our athletes this week, man. Lost Kimbo Slice this week. Um, If you all know, if you don't know who Kimbo Slice is, just Google him, YouTube him. Uh, Was a former YouTube sensation, former street fighter turned MMA fighter. He died at the age of 42. And I know everyone knows that we lost the greatest of all time, Cassius Clay, a.k.a. Muhammad Ali. Lost his battle with Parkinson's disease at the age of 74. Louisville, Kentucky's own Muhammad Ali. Absolutely, Damien. And we would be remiss if we did not mention ex-NBA player, former Sixers coach, Sean Rooks, who also passed away this week. Very unfortunate. So, you know, they say death comes in threes, man. But as you said, it was a tough week for the sports world. Tough sports week, man. Lost, lost, uh, you know, several, several athletes. And and we lost quite possibly uh, the most popular, the most famous, the most influential athlete of all time in Muhammad Ali. Um, You know, a lot of our listeners may be too young to remember Muhammad Ali and just how great he was as a fighter. They only remember him as, you know, the older Muhammad Ali. And let me tell you, man, 
he wasn't called the greatest of all time for no reason. The guy could fight. He was a hell of a fighter. Um, pretty much the best heavyweight who ever laced up his gloves. Um, a lot of people believe he was the best boxer, period, who ever lived. And, um, you know, he fought in a time where boxing was the number one sport. And he was larger than life. Had the the confidence of a giant and the skills to back it up here. And what made Muhammad Ali special was the fact that as big as he was, he was still able to go in the ring, be light on his feet, throw lightning, quick punches. His jab was like a ramrod. His right hand was crushing, you know, and he would tell you before the fight what he was going to do to you. And then he'll step in the ring and back it up. You know, very influential boxer. What made him special was the things that he did outside of the ring, the things that that he did for the African-American community here in the the United States, the things that that he stood for, the, the way that he inspired people. Unbelievable. And the response that he got from the entire world, not just here in the United States, but everywhere. People love Muhammad Ali and Erica Nelson, director of life skills and community outreach at the University of South Carolina. Now was fortunate enough to to spend some time with Mr. Ali back in 2005 when she was with NYC 2012, a committee put together to try and convince the International Olympic Committee to bring the 2012 Olympic Games to New York City. It didn't go that way. As you know, the 2012 Games were held in London, but she did get the chance of a lifetime to spend three days as the greatest of all times, basically liaison during that time. Going to go to that interview right now with Erica Nelson. Erica, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us here. Happy to, to talk about my experiences with Dr. Ali. We really appreciate you coming on because with the death of the great Muhammad Ali last Friday, we know that, that you had the the esteemed privilege of spending an extended amount of time with him back when you did work with the NYC 2012 committee. So talk a little bit about NYC 2012, what that was, and your role as a sport manager. Well, back in 2001, I uh, began my work with it. Actually, in 2000, I'm sorry. I began my work with the committee. Um, and at that point, they were one of seven U.S. cities bidding to host the 2012 Olympics. And the way that the bid process works is the uh, the city that is being named to host the games given seven years to prepare. And with the games taking place in 2012 that we were planning for and me working on it in 2000, Obviously, you can see that a number of years and, and planning goes into those types of operations. And so um, I was named the sports manager, and one of my key roles was to act as a liaison um, and a recruiter in some respects of um, Olympians and Paralympians, because you not only host the Olympic Games, but you also host the Paralympic Games. And my role was to recruit them to host, uh, to, to support our bid, and then also to um, act as a, almost like an agent. Um, to get them out to events to talk about the bid and to and to talk about the merits of New York City hosting the Olympic Games. And so during my time, I was able to attend the 2004 Games in Athens and support many Olympians, not only from the U.S., but around the world who were supporting the Games coming to New York. And uh, that is when I had the privilege of, uh, you know, really hearing about and, and really learning about and appreciating all the efforts of the many Olympians who have um, who have worn that USA across their chest, and, uh, and that's kind of when it all began for me back in September of 2000. You were talking to me earlier, so, you know, we want to catch the listeners up to speed on just coming up with the idea of going after different Olympians, different great American figures to put in front of the International Olympic Committee. Yes, well, the way that that process works is... is um, you, you go through a, a bid process there in your in your home country, um, and you're named that designee, and then you join the international um, bid competition. Um, so we were one of seven international cities bidding to host the games, and then we were the finalists um, two years prior to the decision in July of 2005. So it was uh, New York City, it was London, Paris, Madrid, and Moscow were the five cities that were all bidding to host 
um, the games in 2012. And so that process really involves, once you become a finalist, you make a presentation, an hour-long presentation, to the International Com- Olympic Committee made up of 102 members from around the world, and they vote on who should host um, each of the Olympic Games. And so for us, we really wanted to bring the wow factor. We wanted to really impress these these voting members, and we thought in order to do that, we needed to bring the most high-profile Olympians, celebrities, anyone who really would uh, talk about the merits and, and speak to how great the Olympic Games would be in New York. And, you know, there's no one more iconic than Muhammad Ali as a professional and as an Olympic athlete. Right, and your role there in, in Singapore was to be Mr. Ali's liaison, correct? Yes, that is correct, correct Pierre. My role, once, once we um, were able to uh, to get Mr. Ali and, and certainly his wife, Lonnie, played a major role in, in, in any of his um, activities and, and visits and appearances to uh, agree to join us um, during that short period of time. We had other athletes who were with us for many days before that, just, uh, you know, making their presence felt and, and talking about the, the benefits of the games. But Mr. Ali and um, his wife, Lonnie, were there for the three days. And my role was he had very specific places that we wanted Mr. Ali to make appearances, uh, to, to uh, visit with the media. Um, at that time, he really wasn't able to to talk much at all, but really just his presence um, was very powerful and got a lot of attention for the bid. So my role was once we determined where we wanted Mr. Ali to be, um, you know, what just happened to be sitting in the hotel of the IOC members and invited them over to meet him and such, uh, my role was to follow the schedule um, that we had created um, and make sure that he got to where he needed to go um, and, and be with him during those appearances um, all the way through us leaving, um, making the appearances and, and going back to his hotel. So I stayed in the same hotel that he did. I was in touch with the security members he had um, outside of his door on his floor. Um, I was in, in touch with his driver um, and just making sure that, that Lonnie was aware and comfortable with all the appearances. Now, Erica, I know you to be a consummate professional, but how cool was it to be in the same room to have different conversations and just be around the great Muhammad Ali? I think that here. I think it, it all started with myself and a very very well-known Olympic gold medalist in her own right, Miss Donna Di Verona. She also competed in 1954 games with, with Mr. Ali, and she was very instrumental in um, getting him uh, agreeing and Lonnie agreeing to make the trip to Singapore. So uh, Donna and I made the trip, just the two of us, to pick up Muhammad Ali from the airport. And there seemed to be, I don't know how people found out, but there seemed to be a buzz around the airport that Muhammad Ali was coming. And so uh, Don and I started to get a little nervous again. It's the two of us versus the, it wasn't a big airport, but there was certainly more people um, there that could have uh, overwhelmed the situation. And, you know, we got word when they landed, and uh, you see them coming out of the area after they've landed. And the way that this particular airport is, is there's glass that separates the um, the area where the luggage comes down, the baggage plane area, from the uh, from the, the people who they pick up their friends, family, et cetera. And so as he comes out, people can see him, but you can't get to your the other passengers until they've come out of this exit area. So people see him, and the word gets around, and a crowd starts to build, and Don and I are like, oh, Lord, what are we going to do with all these people? And so he comes out, and I don't know what it is about these these uh, Singapore citizens. Is they didn't want, it wasn't, you know, 2005, pictures weren't real big. They just wanted to touch him. And so he came out as calm as can be, and he just wanted people just wanted to touch his arms. So Mr. Ali was putting his hand out so people could touch him. He was smiling. He was hugging people. He picked up a baby. Wow. All of the all of the above. And uh, and then after people had their touch, they just kind of faded off into the distance. Next thing I know, we're walking over to the car and. We drive off like it were you and I in the car, just just driving off somewhere. So it was really interesting that they just wanted to have that connection, and he was very patient and touched hands and hugged people and held babies, and, and then it was over. It was over as quickly as it all started, and that's the kind of man that I knew him to be over those three days. 
was just someone who was very willing to just connect with people and to just let them have that moment because he knew what it meant to them. And uh, even though, you know, I saw him in different